You've got a cow. You want to teach it how to live all of its life in the open ocean. Still retaining its air breathing characteristics. What do you have to do from an engineering point of view to change the cow into a whale? Hmm, good question. David Belinsky was nominated for a Golden Crocoduck a few years ago, but I've resurrected the nomination because we had a couple of other nominations this year on exactly the same theme, improbability. Belinsky is pondering evolution, which apparently requires turning cows into whales. Virtually every feature of the cow has to be changed. It has to be adapted. But since we know that life on Earth and life in the water are fundamentally different enterprises, we have some sense of the number of changes. We're not talking about genetics. We're talking about simple numbers. The skin has to, has to change completely. It has to become impermeable to water. That's one change. Breathing apparatus has to, has to change. A diving apparatus has to be put in place. Lactation systems have to be designed. The eyes have to be protected. The hearing has to be altered. Salivary organs have to be changed. Feeding mechanisms have to be changed. After all, a cow eats grass, a whale doesn't. As I say, I've tried to do some of these calculations. The calculations are certainly, certainly not hard. But they're interesting because I stopped at 50,000. That is morphological change. Okay, that's enough. Let's just go back a bit. Dr. Belinsky, you're a mathematician and a philosopher, and I freely admit that you're much, much smarter than me. You've taught at university, and I came bottom of the class. But even I know that cows did not turn into whales. I think you've been watching too many creationist videos. Yes, I understand you're talking philosophically and the principle of one animal turning into another. But if you're going to count the number of changes from one particular species to another, at least get your examples right. Whales and cows both evolved from a common ancestor that lived about 50 million years ago, partly in the water and partly on land. By the way, I know Belinsky claims not to be a creationist, but he's using a creationist argument. He's a senior fellow of the Discovery Institute and his breach of the Ninth Commandment is promoting the creationist cause, so he does qualify for a coveted golden crocoduck. Belinsky counts at least 50,000 changes from a cow to a whale because, he explains, a cow is a land animal completely unadapted to living in the water. But the artiodactyl is already halfway there, so let's say it needs half as many changes, about 25,000. It needs to get bigger, have its nostrils moved higher, its hands would have to be used as flippers, and so on. And this has to be done over the course of about 50 million years. Well, let's see. If the animal takes seven years to reach breeding age, about halfway between a whale and a rodent, then 25,000 changes would have to take place over seven million generations. That's about one change every 285 generations, hardly outside the bounds of possibility. But what are the chances of these thousands of changes happening in exactly the right way to make a whale? Now there I would agree with Berlinski, the odds against it are staggeringly high. So how did such impossible odds get beaten? The answer lies in the story of Sandeep Singh, who won $30 million in the Mega Millions Lottery. Sandeep Singh, his friends call him Sunny, and obviously it's a sunny day for him today. And I just want to welcome him to the stage, obviously, and this Jack. Congratulations. Okay. And here's Jack Whittaker, who won $315 million in the Powerball Lottery. Neil Wanless won $232 million. And Solomon Jackson Jr. won $260 million. So what, you might think? Well, the odds of Singh or any of the others winning is 1 in 175 million, which means that the odds of Singh and Whitaker and Wanless and Jackson winning are 875 million billion billion to 1. So how were such odds beaten without any of us thinking it extraordinary? Well, the astute among you will already have figured out why. The odds against anything happening are, of course, going to be astronomically high if you try to achieve a known outcome. In other words, if you name those people who are going to win the lotteries. I don't play the lottery, but as far as I know, a jackpot just keeps getting bigger until a winner is found, so the odds of someone winning are in fact statistically one in one, a certainty. If Singh and Whitaker and Wanless and Jackson hadn't won four other people would have won. 
We can lengthen the odds even more by looking at the chances of Singh or Whittaker or Wanless even being born. They're about the same as the chances of me being born which are astronomically high against it. Maybe I'm only here because a German pilot met a girl at a wedding, and the extra few seconds he spent waving goodbye to her from the cockpit of his bomber delayed his takeoff, which meant that he dropped his bombs over Portsmouth a few seconds later than planned, so that instead of killing my father, one of the bombs killed the man standing next to him. Going even further back, if my ancestor John Hadfield hadn't signed this contract to buy a farm in 1605, he would have stayed at his old farm in Whitfold, and all of my subsequent family history would have been different. Even my great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandparents wouldn't have been born. The odds against me being born are astronomical, because every tiny event in history had to happen exactly the way it happened. No, it's not fate or divine will, it's simple. If I hadn't been born, someone else would have been born. If Sandeep Singh hadn't won the lottery, someone else would. And if the artiodactyl hadn't evolved into a whale, it would have evolved into something else. And that's the problem with similar probability arguments, like the one that says the odds are astronomically against the Earth to exist as we know it. Again, if you start with the Earth as we know it and work backwards, then of course the odds are astronomically against. But if you start with the universe as it is and calculate the odds of an Earth-like planet, in other words a planet that's cool enough for water not to boil and warm enough that it doesn't freeze, a planet with a magnetic field to warn off solar wind, then the odds shorten to near certainty. Out of the trillions upon trillions of star systems, there must be billions of planets that fit the bill. But that brings us to the next probability argument. The planet might have the right environment and ingredients, but what are the chances chemicals will come together to form life? Abiogenesis is the idea that life can form from non-living material, which is also called spontaneous generation, which was proven wrong over 200 years ago. Whoa, wait, what? Oh, it's Cherry Boy. He's back as a YouTuber called Horse Will Be. As what? I don't know. Now, what's this about abiogenesis also being called spontaneous generation? No prizes for guessing that Horse Will Be got this wrong. Abiogenesis is called abiogenesis. Spontaneous generation is a discredited Aristotelian idea that tried to explain the sudden overnight appearance of things like maggots and mushrooms. It didn't try to explain the formation of nucleic acids. That's abiogenesis. See the difference? Spontaneous generation was disproved by Louis Pasteur and John Tyndall in this simple experiment. They showed that apparently spontaneously generated organisms had their origins in spores and eggs. But we wouldn't expect Horse Will Be to know that because he's just reading some crap he got off the internet. But back to the question of probability. The smallest living cell on Earth has a DNA string of some one million pairs of DNA, and it has 600 genes. If we cut this number and just took a quarter of that, we would have a string of some 250,000 base pairs of DNA. That is still a hefty number. The chances of such an arrangement of DNA arising by sheer chance are 4 to the 250,000th power, and that's generous. A video called Chatting with Charlie makes the same case. It, uh, Sir Frederick Hoyle said the chance of the chemicals of which DNA occur were to show up in the same place at the same time is like 10 to the... 40,000. Of course, Hoyle wrote this long before new discoveries showed that DNA had evolved, probably from RNA. And sorry, horse will be, but the cell evolved too. For these things to suddenly appear fully formed would be spontaneous generation, which horse will be has already told us doesn't happen, except in imaginary cases. And as every creationist doesn't know, evolution is not driven by some random process, it's driven by natural selection. I addressed this in a much earlier video that was on my other channel, Potholer 54 Debunks. In trying to similarly explain the difficulty in getting all of the sequences of DNA together, Hal Halbrook is explaining the impossibility of getting 20 numbers in sequence. Now let's suppose that I could play at blinding speed and get all 20 blocks out in just one second then do it again the next second, and every second thereafter. Now, the law of averages says that I can expect to get the 20 blocks out of the box in order at the rate of once every 77 billion years. Natural selection works by selecting those traits, in this case numbers, that are advantageous, fit to survive, and rejecting those that aren't. That's what survival of the fittest is all about. 
So we pick the numbers at random, sure. If the first one out of the box is a 6 or a 12, it gets rejected and goes back. If it's a 1, then that's an advantageous trait that survives. We then move on to the second number, and so on. If we pick one number every second, as the video suggests, then it would only take 20 seconds at the most to get our first correct number, number 1. It'll take 19 seconds at the most to get the next number in the sequence, number 2, and 18 seconds at the most to get number 3. This means it'll take the Mayor of Amity Island just 346 seconds, less than 6 minutes, to get all the numbers in sequence. That's very different to 77 million years, and that's the difference between natural selection and natural chance. They won! <laughs> Tina, tell him how many times he needs to do that to win the prize. 250. That's right, folks, and all in the correct order. But that's impossible. If this was a random process, yes. But now let's apply the rules of natural selection, which says that beneficial traits are kept and non-beneficial ones are rejected. Every time a slot machine comes up with a little bacterium, it stays there and the wheels that didn't show a bacterium roll again. If there are six symbols on the rollers, each of these wheels will come up with a bacterium one time out of six. If it takes ten seconds for each pull on the slot machine, that means it'll take about a minute for each wheel to register a bacterium. And since each wheel is running at the same time, and all 250 machines are running at the same time, it'll take just one minute for every single one to hit the jackpot. This is why the casinos don't let you select which symbol to hold on every wheel, Apparently, they understand evolution. And finally, there's the probability pusher who has the occasional senior moment. I'm assuming that one million beneficial mutations are needed to make a species evolve into another. I'm assuming that 30 million species have existed throughout all time. This is actually the estimate for species alive today. I'm assuming that every single beneficial mutation is kept in the population once it occurs, which means that natural selection is perfect. Now, and yada yada yada, the probability of evolution is one in ten to the wait, power. Wait, 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 wait! I got all the assumptions, and I saw the final result. What's missing is how you actually work this all out. You know, the yada 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 in the middle. I guess we'll never know. Creationists love to focus on the huge numbers and show just how improbable improbable odds are while skipping over the detail of how these numbers are derived in the first place. Like, for example, the calculation I've made that Venom Fang X, now calling himself Horse Will Be, will ever stop reading internet blogs and read just one page of a primary school science book. Computing the amount of homeschooling he must have received from creationist parents, coupled with a high level of hormonal activity, the calculation is... Yada, yada, yada. And the answer is... 1 in 10 to the power of 90 trillion. 10 to the 40,000. 4 to the 250,000th power.